Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us for the June 2023 AB 617 Portside Community Steering Committee meeting. Buenos días, o buenas tardes a todos, y gracias por reunirse con nosotros para la reunión del Comité Directivo de la Comunidad Portside de junio 2023. At this moment, I will hand over the mic over to our interpreter, Vicky, who will provide instructions on how to access interpretation. Okay. Uh, bienvenidos sean todos eh, y muchas gracias por acompañarnos hoy. Antes de empezar la reunión, explicaremos las funciones necesarias para acceder a la interpretación simultánea al español. Si están utilizando su computadora portátil, o computadora de escritorio, a favor de localizar el icono con figura de globo en la parte inferior de su pantalla cuando este aparezca en un minuto y luego pulsen en interpretación del lenguaje, language interpretation, y seleccionen el idioma español. Si están conectándose desde su teléfono, iPad o dispositivo similar, busquen el menú con los tres puntitos en la esquina superior del lado derecho de su pantalla y pulsen interpretación del lenguaje y luego español. Esto permite que escuchen la traducción al español con un 80% de volumen y el audio en inglés se escuchará al fondo con un 20% de volumen. También tienen la opción de apagar el audio en inglés pulsando Mute Original Audio uh, ubicado en el mismo menú donde eligieron el idioma español. Gracias. Um, eso termina las instrucciones en español. Speaking as the interpreter to it, do we also give the instructions for people to choose the English channel? In English. Yes. Okay. Uh, so if you are joining us for this afternoon, uh, thank you. These are the instructions for English. Um, if you're using a laptop or a desktop computer, please look for the figure of a globe at the bottom of your screen when it shows up in a minute and luego, and afterwards select English as your language. Um, if you're connecting from your phone or your iPad or another uh, similar device, please look for the menu with the, the three dots at the top right of your screen. Click on that and then also find the globe uh, icon and click on that and then choose your language of English. This will allow anything that is stated in Spanish will be interpreted also simultaneously onto that English channel. Otherwise, you would not understand anything that's being said in Spanish. That completes the instructions both for Spanish and English. And thank you very much. And now we'll wait for the channels to activate. Thank you so much, Vicky. So the Spanish and English interpretation channel should be available now at the bottom of your screen using the globe interpretation icon. Um, we'll give it a few moments for folks to join the appropriate channel. And if someone could give me a thumbs up if the Spanish interpretation is currently working, that'd be great. Hola, Alicia. ¿Sí está funcionando? Sí. Sí, está. sí se oye perfecto. Gracias. Great. Moving along. Um, once again, we wanted to give everyone a warm welcome and um, thank you for joining us to the June 2023 Portside Community Steering Committee meeting. Um, we have a um, big agenda today, so we'll do our best to um, get through um, all the items and give them adequate time. Um, so at this moment, um, we'll move on to the next slide. And I'll quickly go over the objectives for today's meeting, um, which includes the, um, the discussion and vote on the formation of the three subcommittees um, we've been talking about um, throughout this past year. Um, then um, we'll be receiving an update from the Port of San Diego on the maritime clean air strategy. 
Um, following that, we're going to be receiving an update from the San Diego County Air Pollution Control District on its community air monitoring efforts. And then we'll be learning about um, SANDAG, San Diego, and Imperial County Sustainable Freight Strategy. And then um, briefly um, learning about a letter of support they um, are I'm requesting from um, the committee, uh, but it will only be a discussion item at today's meeting. Moving along to the agenda, um, following roll call and general updates, we'll move along to um, an action item to approve the meeting notes from May 2023. My apologies for the typo. Um, and moving along to the next action item, which is the approval of the formation and scope of work of the three subcommittees. Um, following that, we'll have the presentation from the um, Port of San Diego on the maritime clean air strategy. Um, and then the presentation from the port side community air monitoring efforts. And then we'll close out um, the meeting with um, the two presentation items from SANDAG, starting with the letter of support that um, they'll be briefly discussing about on the Harbor 2.0 project, um, and then the sustainable freight implementation strategy they're developing. Um, and then we'll close out with some public comments and closing remarks. And then we'll um, brief, briefly walk through the meeting agreements um, that we um, bring to all our meetings. Uh, we ask folks to please create a space for everyone to contribute, um, which includes please stepping up if you haven't um, contributed to the meeting and stepping back if you um, have already done so to allow others to um, speak. Um, we ask for only one person to speak at a time. Um, and for folks to raise their hands, we can call on them to ask their questions or provide their input. We ask for folks to um, please listen to each other, respect each other's opinions, knowledge and perspectives, um, and to please be conscious of time, um, and to please speak slowly and clearly for um, our interpreters. At this time, I'll pass it on to my colleague, Anna, who will um, do um, a roll call. Great, thank you, Trudy. Um, and I'll be pulling up the roll call list right now. Okay, um, so we'll go ahead and begin roll call. So um, once I call your name, please say here or hello. Um, so we'll go ahead and start. Um, so for the first member, Keith Corey, um, know that they'll be absent today. Um, next, we have Shelby Busso. Shelby, not seeing Shelby. Um, okay. Um, Jack let also let us know that he'll be um, absent today. Uh, Massey. Good evening. I'm here. Hello, Massey. Thank you. Um, Sarah Joby. Hi, Sarah. good evening. I'm here. Hello, good evening. Um, is Lydia here as well? That's Lydia. Um, Sandy, um, Commissioner Sandy Naranjo. Here. Hi, Sandy. Um, is Philip also here? Yes, I'm here. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Tim? I'm here. Uh, Mariela Rodriguez? I'm here. Hello, Mariela. Um, Nick? Okay. Present. Hello, Nick. Um, Joy Williams? Good evening. I'm here. Hello, good evening. Let's see, Martin. Um, is David here? David Walsh? Let's see, David as well. Um, Roman Partida Lopez? Not seeing Roman. 
Um, Stephanie Yun? I'm here. Yes. Um, Jose Marquez Chavez? I'm here. Um, is Diane here as well? Yes, present. Well then, thank you. Um, Samantha Lu? Good evening, I am present. Good evening, thank you. Is AC Dema here? Okay. Um, Diana Willier? I'm here. Hello, Diana. Hello. Um, is Liana here as well? No, she is not. Okay, thank you. Uh, Filomena Marino? Not seeing Janice. Here, Presento. Not seeing Janice. Okay. Um, Hillary Medina. Hillary. Um, Alicia Sanchez. Presente. Uh, Margarita Moreno. Presente. Okay. Um, Naomi Sanchez. Okay, um, Vanessa Contreras. Um, Salvador. Um, Salvador. Um, Montserrat Hernandez. Presente. Gracias, Montserrat. Um, Silvia Calzada. Okay. Um, Silvia's here. She gave me a note that she's going to log in again since her mic isn't working. Okay, great, thank you. Um, Ashley, Valentin Gonzalez. Okay, I don't see Ashley. Um, Josephine Talamantes. I don't see Josephine. Um, and then Maritza Garcia um, notified us that they'll be late to the meeting. Um, so with that, it looks like we did not meet quorum. I mean, on Anna, could you check if we meet quorum with Marissa present? No. Looks like not as well. Okay, thanks for checking. Mm -hmm. Great, moving along. I wanted to move along to our general update section where we receive announcements and updates from um, relevant agencies and partners. Um, and I have a few folks on my list already, starting with um, Peter Wynn at, the, um, at UC Davis. Yeah, hi everyone. Thanks Judy and, and to the Ayers District for giving us time to make a uh, brief announcement, um, but my name is Peter Nguyen um, at UC Davis. Um, we previously um, had sent out a uh, survey of our AB617 study, um, and we just wanted to let you all know that we have extended the um, survey deadline again to July 21st, so another about three or so weeks. Um, and yeah, we, we highly encourage folks um, who have not um, filled out the survey yet, um, um, to fill them out if you have some time. It does take about 10 minutes and 11 questions. Um, and there is a raffle for uh, resident members. Um, and yeah, we already received a good number of responses, um, but just appreciate all the feedback. So um, any feedback that you have on AB 617 and the whole CSC process, we greatly appreciate and take into um, consideration in our study. 
Um, and so, yeah, we, we highly encourage you to fill it out if you haven't done so. I'll put the link um, into the chat um, and also a, a link to the PDF with a QR code, um, whichever works best um, for you all. And then, um, yeah, also the email for um, I and Jonathan London um, if you have any questions. But yeah, thank you so much um, for your time and, and appreciate all the feedback that we can get on the survey. Um, yeah, and I'll pass it back. Great. Thanks so much, Peter. Yes, friendly reminder to folks to please complete that survey and we can send it out along as well. Uh, moving along um, to Jason from US Navy. Thank you, Chewy, uh, and thank you for inviting me to come and speak today. My name is Jason Golumski Jones, and I am the Navy Region Southwest Fleet Environmental Director. Uh, I, I come tonight to talk to you about uh, the Supplemental Environmental Impact Statement for Improving Home Port Facilities for Three Nimitz-Class Aircraft Carriers uh, that we have begun. Um, the purpose of this uh, short discussion is to provide you some information about our action over at North Island and to explain where we are in the process of, a, of you know, an environmental impact statement or EIS. We are at the beginning of a two-year environmental review process, and we want to know what is important to you about this project. The comments and concerns that we collect over the next month uh, are critical in helping us uh, provide a robust analysis for uh, what we are doing and uh, want to make sure that we get all those comments for consideration. Uh, a little background on this is that starting in about 2000, the Navy increased the number of aircraft carriers that were home ported at North Island to three from the original two. At that time, we estimated that all three carriers would be in port for the same time, an average of 13 days a year. In 2009, the Navy addressed changes to the maintenance, training, and deployment requirements by evaluating the environmental effects associated with infrastructure improvements and evaluated traffic management measures to reduce traffic related impacts, as well as three aircraft carriers being into port for up to 29 days a year. Um, from, from there, we now find ourselves at 2023, almost 15 years later, which brings us to today. The Navy is starting this two year environmental review process that we will update the previous analysis to address current requirements. During the process, the Navy will investigate, evaluate, and report on potential environmental effects associated with routine pier side maintenance activities, a proposed electrical shore side power infrastructure upgrades, and current mission requirements, which may result in three CVNs or carriers being simultaneously in port at North Island for up to 180 days a year. Although it is considered highly unlikely that it is a 180 day scenario would ever occur, the Navy proposed a conservative number of days per year in order to ensure a full understanding of the potential effects that the simultaneous presence of aircraft carriers at North Island may have on all local communities. North Island, which is part of Naval Base Coronado, of course, is located about a mile west of and across the San Diego Bay from downtown San Diego. North Island encompasses almost 2,800 acres of land on the western half of Coronado Island. The Navy is working with San Diego Gas and Electric to understand whether or not San Diego Gas and Electric's existing infrastructure can accept the Navy's increased electrical requirements. There is a need to upgrade existing electrical infrastructure. These upgrades may be extended down First Street to, through Coronado, but will not extend, extend beyond Orange Avenue. The Navy has identified resource areas of traffic, socioeconomics, environmental justice, and air quality as important and plans to thoroughly investigate how these areas will impact the Navy's proposal. These are resources that we have thought of but propose the, of the public scoping process to seek public input. If you have any specific matters you would like addressed in a certain area, we wanna make sure that we receive comments. Tonight is the first of three nights of public meetings 
um, to listen to everyone's comments. Uh, the, um, the meeting itself is going to be held as a, um, a walkabout. So you can come at any time. Uh, tonight, it is in Barrio Logan at the Logan Memorial Education Campus, uh, building K101. We start at 6.30 p.m. and we'll go till 9 p.m. Um, we have stations set up so that you can walk freely amongst the stations and learn specific pieces of each part of the project. And then if you would like, comment on the, on the, on the project there. Tomorrow night, June 28th, we are at Coronado Community Center at the Nautilus Room on 1845 Strand Way. That one will start at 5 p.m. and go to 7.30. On the 29th, we will be at Imperial Beach at the Burris Auditorium. And we will, again, will be starting at 5 p.m. till 7.30 p.m. In addition to that, you can also go to the Navy website, which I will add to the chat after I'm done speaking, um, to read a little bit more about the project and provide comments electronically there. Unfortunately, tonight during my conversation with you all, I will not be able to take handwritten comments or any kind of comments for the, for the uh, EIS um, scoping, but we are more than excited to hear from you in, in the various avenues that I've, I've addressed. I guess I'll stop there um, and I thank you all for your time. Thank you so much, Jason. I'm moving along to um, Domingo, uh, the Air District. Thank you very much, Chui. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, I just have a couple of uh, relatively quick announcements. Um, or updates to share. One is that uh, the district received a permit application from US Development Clean Fuels Group for a, a new operation in National City um, that proposes the installation of nine rail spurs and five fixed truck loading spots to transfer fuel directly from rail cars to tanker trucks via permanent loading racks in the Portside community. Uh, this operation is expected to receive approximately 115 trucks per day via West 18th Street and exiting the facility on West uh, 19th Street. Uh, the City of National City published the, uh, a notice for environmental review and comment, which I will upload to the chat just for folks to, um, to be able to see it. Uh, the comment period ends on July 3rd, um, so early next week. And just to let folks know, the district uh, is preparing a, a comment letter uh, that we will share uh, with this group. Uh, we'll send over via email just uh, for everybody's information once that letter is finalized. Uh, again, I'll post the notice on the chat um, as well as a link where you can find more information. So that's one update. And the second one is uh, just that um, our, the district is launching a strategic planning process and we're seeking the public's input uh, to develop our long-term strategic plan. And we really encourage everybody to participate in this process. I will also put a, a link on the chat where we have our strategic planning page where folks can find out more information about upcoming workshops that we have where folks can uh, participate in, and provide input as well as a, a survey if they want to provide input via a survey that we have online. Um, our first community forum will be next Thursday, July 13th from, um, from 5 uh, p.m. to 7 p.m. Uh, and that will be virtual. And then we'll have a, an in-person uh, forum on July 27th um, at 5 p.m. as well. Uh, location still to be determined, but uh, more information uh, on, on the link that I'll put on the chat. And that's it for me. Thank you, Thank you Domingo. And I received two other notifications, one from Liliana at CARB, followed by Tim at Sandbag. Hi, um, everyone, thanks. Um, I just wanted to announce we um, just sent out a public notice for um, the blueprint. Oh, there I am. Um, the blueprint 2.0. Um, 
that is out in draft form right now. And we're gonna have public workshops in July, specifically July 7th, 11th and 18th. And um, the July 18th meeting is actually going to be in Spanish um, with English interpretation. And we're um, hoping to discuss the draft blueprint 2.0 um, get your thoughts. And again, the, the draft blueprint or the blueprint 2.0 is um, the guidance document for implementation of AB 617 that um, communities and air districts um, follow while um, you know, developing SERPs or um, camps. And it also includes other strategies for um, the Community Air Protection Program to reach other communities that haven't been selected for SERPs or camps. So um, for us at CARB, it's really uh, important to get your perspective as a community that's already developed a SERP and a camp on how we can effectively uh, reduce air pollution in disadvantaged communities throughout the state. I will drop the link on the in the chat for um, these workshops, and I hope you can join. Um, and then you'll find also the the um, the link to the the draft blueprint 2.0, and we have an open comment period um, until July 31st. Thank you. Thank you, Liliana. Tim. Thank you, Chewy. Um, so quick update from Sandeg on the 2025 regional plan. We will be hosting a virtual workshop this Thursday, June 29th at 6 p.m., where we'll answer these questions. What is our regional plan? How will the plan make our future transportation system more convenient, fair, and safe? And how can you, shelp, how, how can you help shape the plan to address the needs of your community? I'll post the link to RSVP in the chat. Um, but the meeting will be held on Zoom with simultaneous interpretation in Spanish uh, this Thursday, June 29th at 6 p.m. Thanks. Thank you so much. And just double checking, um, Nick, I saw you had your hand raised for a quick second. Yeah, um, two things, Chewy. I, I, I just wanted to kind of um, elevate and emphasize how, um, how big a deal the um usd fuels transfer station um proposal that that uh, domingo flagged is 150 it would bring 115 uh diesel trucks to the heart of national city um that's pretty close to the estimates for both um cargo terminals at the port and that's this is just one facility and so it's 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 a huge problem. I think it's going to really um, threaten the progress that we've made so far with the SERP. And and so you know, if folks are interested in giving comments, um, I highly suggest folks do that. Um, the other thing is on Thursday, um, APCD is hosting a workshop for uh, as a part of the Air Toxics Hotspots uh, program. Um, for the Pacific Ship Facility, and so this is this is uh, an annual update on their progress for their risk reduction uh, plans. So these are facilities that put workers and community members at a heightened risk of getting cancer. And so these are, again, these are are, are facilities of lots of concern. Um, and so you know, folk Pacific Ship is kind of on the south end of Barrio Logan. Uh, the impact zone includes parts of includes schools like Emerson Elementary, um, Dorothy Pet Waste Park, um, and so folks kind of in the South Press neighborhood, uh, South Barrio Logan neighborhoods. If you're interested in participating, I'll make sure to put a link to that virtual meeting that's happening on Thursday at 5 p.m. Thank you for raising that, Nick. Um, I do want to flag that. Um, I see that Ashley Valentin Gonzalez um, has joined the meeting. Um, Anna, can you confirm whether that um, that meets her quorum requirements for taking action? 
Yes, we we need quorum with that. And yes, I'll we'll be sure to um, summarize and provide links for all these and send them to you all over email. I know there were a lot of updates, um, and many important ones. Um, moving along to our next agenda item, um, and this is our standard um, action item on meetings. Um, is um, seeking for approval of last month's meeting notes and tonight's agenda. Um, if we could get a motion and a second from committee members. I'm sorry, Chewy. Um, I, I didn't understand. Or do we have a quorum or do we not have a quorum? We do. Um, okay. Since Ashley joined, yes. Okay. Sorry. I, I couldn't, I didn't hear the comment clearly. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So um, does someone want to make a motion on the meeting notes and tonight's agenda? Motion to approve the meeting notes. I'll second that. This is Sylvia Calzada. Great. And just to clarify, Nick, did that also include tonight's agenda? Yes. Great. So we have a motion from Nick. Um, and apologies, I missed who gave the second? Sylvia. 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 Great. Thank you. Um, and with that, can um, if we'll do a and a vote. So if anyone is opposed to the motion, please raise your hand. If not, we'll consider it approved. Great, so then last month's notes and tonight's agenda are approved. Thank you all. Great, now we'll move along to our next action item, which is the approval of the formation and scope of work of the three subcommittees. Um, and we'll start this off with um, Monique. Thank you, Chewy. Um, I just wanted to walk us through um, pretty quickly what the process has been so far to get us to this um, point this evening um, to take action to formalize um, the subcommittees and also their scope of work that you all had a hand in co-creating. So back in December and January, um, uh, I had one-on-one -on -one conversations with, with many of you um, and from those conversations emerge certain themes um, around um, priority areas that you'd like the, the committee as a whole to focus on, um, but also ways of being that you'd like us to integrate into our meetings as well. Um, so I reported back in January what those kind of key themes were um, and, and, and how they were emerging. Um, then that informed um, the work we did together in February. Uh, we had breakout groups where there was um, discussion about the creation of potential subcommittee focus um, areas, which included um, community outreach, um, also around accessibility, around monitoring data, um, and then the third around um, implementation and funding of, of the SERP specifically. Um, and then in March, we started to, to think of all the different um, tasks or um, sub-focus areas within those kind of three key themes. Um, and this was with um, you know, self-selected groups. So folks decided which group they kind of wanted to go to and further cultivate the list of potential um, um, items that they'd be working on um, for each group. Um, and then in May, we had an opportunity to meet in person. Again, each person, um, both CSE members and committee members had an opportunity to, to self-select which group they wanted to be a part of and uh, participated in the prioritization exercise um, to further kind of refine what folks want to be working on in the next couple months um, or so. And then here we are today in June. 
So this has been pretty much a six month process of um, developing the themes um, and the containers for these different groups, identifying the priorities or, or the, the action items and then honing down into what those priorities are. And so today we wanted to be able to share with you, um, again, a synthesized version of both the of both the scope of work and what those priorities are, and then have you all take formal action today um, as um, a CSC um, to be able to have those subcommittees move forward um, in that work as well. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Chewy, um, who's gonna walk you through uh, very briefly, just so that we make sure we're on time for all the amazing presentations ahead, but walk us through kind of the um, overarching um, uh, you know, goals for each subcommittee that you've all helped cultivate both collectively and then in these selected groups um, and also the priority areas um, that, that you'd like um, each of these subcommittees um, to, to focus on, um, you know, in the, in the upcoming uh, uh, year. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, hand it over to Chewy. And I'll hand it over to Anna, who will actually walk through these. <laughs> no worries. Thank you. Thank you, Monique, for providing that overview of the process of the subcommittees thus far. Um, so I'll be walking over that scope of work, which really includes the purpose of each subcommittee, the priorities that have been identified through these working groups that have taken place, um, as well as just a reminder of what each subcommittee has agreed on in terms of meeting dates and how often they'll be meeting. Um, so I'll be running um, through each subcommittee, and then at the end we'll have time for some discussion, and then with that we can move to vote for the approval of the formation as well as the scope of work of these subcommittees. Um, so to start us off, I'll begin with the SERP implementation and funding subcommittee. Um, so for this subcommittee, uh, this subcommittee identified the purpose as tracking um, SERP progress and support funding opportunities and actions that contribute to SERP implementation and the achievement of SERP goals. Um, in regards to what the subcommittee has agreed on, um, they've agreed to meet monthly. Um, so the, the subcommittee will be meeting on a monthly basis, and then they will be providing quarterly updates um, as a full committee to the full committee. Um, next slide, please. Um, so here um, you'll see the listed identified priorities. Um, so again, this includes all the priorities that this subcommittee um, has identified. I know at our last meeting in May, we focused on um, creating an action plan for the top from these priorities selecting two, um, but this includes that full list. Um, so you'll see the representative list of everything that has been identified um, back in the other prior meetings. Um, so I'll provide a quick overview. I won't be reading all of these um, bullet point for bullet point, um, but some of these priorities include identifying projects um, for community air grants and supporting funding opportunities, improving transparency of lease process and criteria, and ensuring alignment with the MCAS through the development of guidelines, um, identifying barriers and developing strategies for accessing resources, ensuring that each public agency is aligning their legislative priorities, as well as advocating for funding, um, developing and implementing strategies to ensure planning alignment with other agencies, and developing a real-time dashboard um, that will be presented every quarter. Um, we can go ahead and move to the next slide. Um, and so next is the Air Monitoring and Data Subcommittee. Next slide, please. Um, and so for the purpose of this subcommittee, the purpose um, is here is to inform and guide APCD staff on how to best display and communicate monitoring data that shows meaningful patterns and trends in a manner that is accessible, relevant, and actionable. Um, and so this subcommittee will be meeting quarterly um, and providing quarterly updates to the full committee, such as the update that they'll be providing today. Um, so in regards to the priorities that this subcommittee identified, um, these priorities include generating infographics and slash pictures that make the data more relatable, 
um, clarifying information that is confusing or perhaps difficult to understand, um, performing risk comparisons um, and being able to phrase these comparisons in a way that people can relate to, um, observing trends from monitoring station data for consistency, connecting the data um, that are to strategies and just everyday activities, um, establishing a reference for air quality data to determine negative health effects. Um, and then the last priority is that APC will be checking materials with this subcommittee to ensure accessibility. Um, so then the last subcommittee group is the Community Outreach and Engagement Subcommittee. Um, so the purpose of this subcommittee is the next slide. Um, the purpose of this subcommittee has been identified to inform the broader portside community about SERP implementation, as well as grow the CSC membership and engage additional portside community members um, in meaningful opportunities to shape implementation. Um, this subcommittee has agreed to meet quarterly um, during the in-person meetings, and there will also be quarterly updates to the full committee um, on a quarterly basis. Um, so we can go to the next slide. So in terms of the priorities that this group has identified, um, these include updating, updating and creating um, an onboarding protocol for any new CSC members that join, as well as recruiting new members. Um, specifically within groups that include youth, um, young adults, portside residents, and indigenous leaders. Um, along with that is drafting letters of support for environmental justice grant seekers, um, organizing and perhaps even hosting an annual community event, particularly aimed to increase um, awareness and showcase the work that portside CSC has done. Um, facilitating and receiving regular presentations either to or from the body of Logan planning group. And last, um, embed audio pictograph communication at meetings. Um, so with that, um, again, this is just an overview of, again, the scope of work of each subcommittee, primarily around the, the purpose, meeting cadence, and as well as identified priorities. So we want to um, open it up to this um, to the full committee. Um, again, our recommended action is the formation and the scope of work of the to discussion to see if there's any flags to raise on any of the that were shared, whether that's within the priorities or the purpose. If there's any disagreement or anything that needs to be modified, um, so we can go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, so with that, I, want, I do want to open it up to discussion um, and or comments um, on any of the subcommittees um, identified as priorities. Yeah. Um, if folks could raise, raise their them. hand or add their question or comment in the chat, that'd be great. Sí, eh, nada más mi pregunta era si sabemos quiénes están siendo parte de estos comités, o sea, qué tan balanceado tenemos, ¿verdad? En cada uno de los comités, las personas que estamos siendo parte de este grupo. Gracias, es Montserrat. Great question. Um... Um, Montserrat asked about um, how we can ensure um, balance of representation um, in each of the subcommittees. Monique or Domingo, do we have a response for that? 
Sorry, Chuy, I was on mute. I was speaking on mute. Um, yes, I think that one, that's definitely a, a very important point to consider. And I really encourage folks to let us know. I don't think that we have a, a an official list, um, you know, and, and, and also something, um, you know, to consider is that folks don't necessarily have to stay within one subcommittee. I mean, there's there's certainly freedom of moving around the subcommittees if folks want to um, participate in different subcommittees, you know, for, for a period of time. So we, we certainly encourage that as well to, to increase the diversity of, of, of opinions in, in the subcommittees. But um, what we could do is potentially um, ask for folks' preferences and then um, report back to this group as to, you know, who um who wants to be in the different subcommittees and then assess from there if we want to invite more uh you know folks to different subcommittees depending on, on you know the membership of them to make sure that you know it's a well-represented group great thanks domingo any other questions or comments Nick? Yeah, um, so I know some uh, community members in National City have raised um, some concern that there's not monitoring in National City. And so I know in, in past monitoring updates, there's been conversations about uh, starting up some sites in, in National City. And so I don't know, maybe if there's uh, the possibility of including that, like prioritizing, um, I guess, those new sites to be developed and, and active as a part of the subcommittee. Thank you. Thank you for that comment, Nick. And just a, a quick update, we are actively working on, on getting uh, sites uh, up, you know, up and running in National City. We are currently working on two sites, one on the Navy uh, RV parking lot um, and another one at the uh, Train Depot Museum. Um, and we can provide uh, an update as to where we are in the process, but we are, um, you know, making progress. Unfortunately, it's not as fast as we would like to, um, you know, some of, some of these, um, the steps in the process, you know, including securing, securing the land, securing agreement, you know, land agreements, securing agreements with the, um, with the different labs, et cetera, take more time than we would like to, <laughs> but um, we are certainly making progress and, and that's uh, in, you know, part of our priorities for our monitoring efforts in port side, but uh, more information to come, but just so you know, we do have those sites um, that are, that we're working on currently. Thanks, Nick and Domingo. Any final questions or comments? Before we move this on to the vote. Seeing none. Um, now I want to open it up for folks. Um, if someone wants to make a motion and a second to approve three subcommittees as they were described. Hi, this is Stephanie. I had motion to approve the subcommittees. This is Sandy. I'll second. Thanks. Great. So we have a motion from and now moving on to a vote. Um, I don't know if you can pull up the attendance or the voting sheet. Yes, I'm pulling up the voting sheet right now. Okay. All right. Um, okay. Um, Chewie, do you want me to, to do the roll call? Yes, please. Okay. Okay, so I'll go ahead 
and do the roll call for those members um, that are present. When I call your name, feel free to say yes or a or a no or nay, or if you abstain. Um, so we'll go ahead and start off with Matthew. Yes. Okay. And Sarah? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Sandy Naranjo? Yes. Yes. Nick? Nick Paul? Yes. Next we have Ms. Chavez? Yes, yes. Well, um, Hosea? Yes. Um, Dinah? Yes. Janice? Sorry, I thought you called my name earlier. Yes. Thank you. And next we have Mr. Alicia Sanchez. Uh, Margarita Moreno. Sí. Okay, thank you. Sí. Gracias, Margarita. Uh, next we have Montserrat. Sí. Gracias. Silvia. Yes. Thank you. Um, Ashley? Yes. Okay. Um, and then let's check. Um, is Maritza, has Maritza joined us? No. Okay. Um, so that we have 13 yeses. Um, and we don't have any abstains or no's. So with that, um, the motion is approved. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Now moving along to our next agenda item. wanted to pass the mic along to um, Renee Yarmi, who um, um, put together this really great presentation on um, the MCAS implementation efforts that the Port of San Diego is leading. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Well, good evening, Portside Steering Committee. Um, it's my pleasure to present to you all today. I'm Renee Yarmi. I'm a Program Director for Maritime Sustainable Development at the Port of San Diego. I'm joined on the line as well by my colleagues, Phil Gibbons and Peter Eicher from Planning and Environment. So if there's any questions later, we're happy to take those from you. So I'm excited to present today our achievements to date on advancing our port electrification and clean freight initiatives under the Maritime Clean Air Strategy. Next slide, please. As the port strives towards zero emissions, we're implementing initiatives at every link within the supply chain. So this animation that I'll show here now summarizes at a high level some of our zero emission strategies at the port. If you can click, please. Operational this fall, Crowley will be utilizing the first all-electric tug in the United States. Click, please. As an early adopter of shore power infrastructure, the port has three installations at our terminal to date, with a fourth one coming soon at the National City Marine Terminal. You can click to. The use of the first two all-electric mobile harbor cranes in the United States and in all of North America will be coming uh, this summer and operating this winter. And we continue to advance zero emission cargo handling equipment across our terminals. 
We're also regionally coordinating, and click please, with the Air Pollution Control District and other partners to actively advance zero emission truck incentives and other pilot projects. And we recently released a request for proposals to develop the first zero emission truck stop in the United States or in the San Diego region uh, to service our territory. Next slide, please. You can click once more, thank you. So in total, these projects represent an investment of approximately $85 million from the port, our tenants, and our partners since adoption of the Maritime Clean Air Strategy. And as we work our way around the Bay, I'll highlight the various electrification projects, initiatives, and partnerships that further our commitments to the Maritime Clean Air Strategy and health equity for all. Next slide, please. So first, Crowley is advancing the first all-electric tug, which will be the first in service in the United States. The E-Wolf, as it's called, is currently under construction at a shipyard in Alabama. This project also includes a shoreside three megawatt battery energy system, which will be used to charge the tug, as well as 70 kilowatts in solar energy. This particular project and its shoreside infrastructure will help curb some of the energy demands that the tug will require, lower energy costs, and we anticipate that this will be operational uh, later this year in 2023. Next slide, please. As environmental champion, support has been an early adopter of shore power with the first installation at our cruise ship terminal in 2010 making the Port of San Diego among the first ports in California to have shore power available for cruise ships. Recently, the port has doubled the shore power capability at our B Street terminal, as you can see on the photo on the left, at our Broadway Pier cruise, um, pier, sorry, at our Broadway Pier and uh, B Street cruise ship terminals, which now we're allowed to connect two vessels at the same time, further improving air quality, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, and supporting our fulfillment of the California Air Resources Board at birth regulation. In addition, the port installed shore power at our 10th Avenue Marine Terminal to support Dole's operations in 2014. And every vessel calling to 10th Avenue Marine Terminal that supports Dole is plugging into the shore power system. Next slide, please. The port is moving into the construction phase um, uh, of our shore power system at the National City Marine Terminal as well with the approval of the construction contract in April of 2023. Uh, we're working currently with San Diego Gas and Electric to bring new service to this location and construction activities will, will begin later this year with anticipated completion in 2025. Next slide, please. To further support compliance with the California Air Resources Board regulations and continue our emission reductions at our terminals, the Board of Port Commissioners also approved the procurement of a Marine Exhaust Treatment Emissions Capture Control System, or a BONNET, in May of 2022. This rendering depicted here on the slide illustrates how this barge-based system will look, essentially with an armature that pivots across the top and goes over the stack of a vessel to collect the air emissions coming out of the vessel. The bonnet is under construction now and we anticipate this to be operational in late 2024. Next slide, please. To ensure we maintain progress towards our zero emission goals, continued modernization of our 12 kilovolt electrical distribution system, which runs under our terminal, and is uh, depicted in this color coding you see here. It dates back to the 1950s and modernizing this electrical loop is necessary to support our advanced electrification projects and operations on our terminal. The colored portions you see in the center here, what's is the work that's underway now, which is a part of phase three, we call it um, on this diagram here. And a lot of this infrastructure work we're doing is to support the electric mobile harbor cranes that are arriving uh, just in a few weeks here. As we continue to electrify our operations, it's essential that we conduct phases four, five, and six 
And so the board recently approved $3 million in funding to support our continued efforts. So although we do have a substantial amount of work to continue our design effort, we anticipate that additional funding will be needed to uh, support the construction efforts, as well as the installation of additional cargo handling um, equipment chargers on the terminal. Next slide, please. As a port of first, our tenants are there alongside us supporting zero emission goals. Early adopters like Terminal Lift and Dole have leaned in early to the zero emission cargo handling space. And for nearly a decade, Terminal Lift has really progressed piloting of electric reach stackers, trucks, charging units on the terminal, and is proactively exploring off port charging solutions. In addition, Dole has piloted some of the first electric yard tractors on the West Coast and just last year procured five electric yard tractors for their fleet. Joining these ranks, the Stevedoring Services of America or SSA is, has also recently moved forward with the procurement of a 55,000 pound electric heavy lift, which will arrive later this year. So tenants like these are really leading the charge and electrifying their operations as we speak. Next slide, please. The port's procurement of the first two all-electric mobile harbor cranes in North America will replace a near, our largest uh, diesel emitting piece of equipment on the terminal, uh, which is our, our Gottwald harbor crane. To support these cranes, the port's phase three, as I mentioned earlier, that, that uh, infrastructure project is addressing a significant segment of our electrical distribution system by adding a substation and nine crane power outlets to give us the flexibility to use these cranes. Construction effort is well underway with anticipated completion by the end of this calendar year. And the cranes are traveling now via ship and will arrive at 10th Avenue Marine Terminal mid-July, so just about two weeks time. Um, we anticipate having several celebratory events uh, forthcoming to enjoy this major milestone at the port. Next slide, please. To further improve air quality in the port site community, the port is also working with partners like the Air Pollution Control District, the Environmental Health Coalition, and San Diego Gas and Electric to spread the word on zero emission regulations, incentives, and infrastructure for trucks. Earlier this year, we launched a zero emission truck technical assistance program, which provides one-on-one -on -one coaching to truck operators, interested in procuring zero emission trucks and installing the necessary infrastructure. And importantly, we're coordinating uh, funding with our partners to offer incentives to these trucking, uh, to this trucking community to take part in a zero emission pilot to displace 65,000 diesel miles. So as an example, Pesha independently pursued grant funding to procure the first all electric car hauler to conduct short haul cargo movements between National City and Cesar Chavez. The port is in active discussions with tenants and customers to commence additional pilot projects. And we'll be going back to the Board of Port Commissioners later this year with an update. Next slide, please. In addition to this, and in support of, of this goal uh, related to trucks, uh, we've also uh, We've also issued a solicitation for a request for proposals to advance a zero emission truck stop uh, that was released on April 24th and will close on July 7th. But we took feedback received at the November 2022 board meeting and have incorporated this into our RFP to include preferential zero emission charging for trucks calling to and from the district or the port's marine cargo terminals, as well as a request for a phased approach to allow for growth over time advancements in technology, as well as increased demand uh, in the trucking community. So as we close out this request for proposals and review solicitations, we anticipate going back to the board for action moving forward in the fall of this year. In addition to this, the port is also building a broader coalition to promote a network of charging within our region for zero emission trucking. And we recently signed a memorandum of agreement with Caltrans to further this ongoing partnership to look at other corridors and other opportunities for pilot projects in our, in our area. Next slide, please. The port is also collaborating on Harbor Drive 2.0, 
with Caltrans serving as the implementing agency alongside our other partner, SANDAG, um, which I understand you'll hear about more in today's meeting. This initiative is intended to further our mission of moving cargo in a more efficient and greener way, which aligns with our overall emissions reduction objectives. This collaborative effort is intended to improve mobility and access along South Harbor Drive by progressing our goals related to community safety, mobility, and public health. Through project components such, such as improving signal prioritization to prevent truck idling, creating dedicated lanes for, for specific transportation needs, and improving roadway conditions. And more recently, several grant applications have been submitted um, with some, off, uh, some opportunities already received by Caltrans. So I anticipate we'll be hearing a lot more about Harbor Drive 2.0 as we jointly pursue funding with our partners. Next slide, please. The port is also leading by example with our own zero emissions fleet transition plan. Uh, now together we have uh, 14 electric trucks and four electric vans already procured. Some of them are already in operation. And an additional 10 electric vehicles approved as a part of the uh, port's fiscal year 2024 budget. In addition, the port is leveraging the San Diego Gas and Electric Power Your Drive for Fleets program to support the installation of infrastructure to support this transition. And combined with receiving an energized grant to support procurement of fast chargers. So, so we're leaning in by example as well and converting um, near to 25% of our fleet already. Next slide, please. The district has also furthered urban greening initiatives with support from Urban Corps of San Diego and the California Department of Forestry and Fire Protection or CAL FIRE, which included the planting of 20 shade trees in Cesar E. Chavez Park last year and additional plantings in Bayfront Park occurring um, just tomorrow as, I, um, tomorrow, as I understand. But we're continuing this successful partnership and planning for additional tree plantings to grow our tree canopy throughout the, the Port Tidelands. And next slide, please. So thank you to the committee and I'm uh, for your time and I'm available to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Renee. Do folks have any questions, comments for the port? If not, there is a um, email posted on the slide right now for folks who have any follow-ups or things that come up after the meeting. Seeing none. Well, thanks, Renee. And thank, thank you, you for all for the great overview. Thank you. Great. Moving along to um, our next agenda item, which is an update on the Portside Community Air Monitoring efforts. David? Yeah, thanks, Stewie. Um, for those that you don't, don't know me, my name is David Sodeman. I'm the, the chief or, or manager of the monitoring division at the air pollution control district uh, and um, here to present kind of a kind of a different type of presentation that we're gonna we've done in the past for the air monitoring program um, so what we're going to do today if we go to the next slide uh, the point of of this is to kind of give an overview of of kind of a very general overview of what we have um, currently in data in the community um, kind of address some community concerns, kind of briefly talk about the the roadway data um, study that we did a few years ago, um, and then kind of move forward into what we we're, we have our current monitoring fact, what's currently going to be planned on, um, and then also kind of discuss what the future presentation content and outline and, and style will be, as well as um, kind of um, some questions that we have for you regarding that presentation. If we go on to the, the next slide. Um, so for historical purposes, um, the Air Pollution Control District has a regional monitoring 
station that we operated at Perkins Elementary School for a little over 10 years um, before we were asked to relocate uh, due to uh, school improvements uh, in, in uh, where we had our monitor. Um, so we measured for a variety of different pollutants. Um, we measured, you know, ozone, um, oxides of nitrogen, carbon monoxide, sulfur dioxide, uh, as well as, as what we refer to as toxic pollutants, and that refers to uh, metals, um, organic and elemental carbon, which, which we discussed here in the past as being a marker for diesel particulate matter, um, as well as toxic volatile organic compounds. Um, so I just want to provide just a, a very general summary of what we found with, with this 11-year, uh, 12-year uh, uh, data. Um, and this is data that we could pull and compare as we move forward with, with some similar programs uh, in, the, in the future within the community besides just uh, one location. Um, so the graph below here, which um, obviously it's going to be a little bit hard to read, the solid red bar is the standard for uh, either the ozone or the particulate matter um, with an aerodynamic diameter less than two and a half microns, basically small particle size. Um, the different traces is how the data that we collected during those years compared to that standard. You know, what was the value of that standard? So instead of displaying this um, as a concentration, it's it's now a percent of that standard. So if it's below that red line, that means we're below the standard. If we're above that red line, we're above the standard. Um, and as you can see, we kind of started off with some some higher values. Um, you know, 2006, 2007, 2008. But over the last several years, when until we stopped sampling in 2016, um, you can see that the for these two particular pollutants, the concentrations have dropped below the standard uh, in uh, as measured at Perkins Elementary School, uh, which is obviously very good news. Um, if we go on to the next slide, um, we started up regional monitoring uh, in kind of the, the port side area at Sherman Elementary School and uh, technically in, in 2019. Um, but because how the standards is calculated, I didn't want to show a partial year. Um, so we, we were really looking at kind of 2020 and moving forward. And you can see at Sherman Elementary School, we're kind of um, for, for ozone and, and PM 2.5. We are continuing that trend where we're measuring below the standard. Again, good news um, for the criteria pollutants. Um, the toxic pollutants, there's no um, ambient air standard for that, which is why they're not included on these graphs. Uh, instead, it's uh, a risk associated with, with those. And so what you can do is take the concentration, multiply it by the risk factor, and then you can look at, you know, what's the the risk to develop cancer uh, from this particular pollutant. Um, and what we have found in both at the Perkins Elementary School and at Sherman Elementary School is that the concentrations that we are measuring at those locations are elevated compared to some of the other cities that we see in San Diego City uh, or San Diego County. Um, and so we can also, you know, that can also be a part of our data analysis presentations and packages is looking at uh, historical trends from uh, these sites, uh, as well as kind of comparing to, to other cities within San Diego County. Uh, if we move on to the next slide. Um, you know, so when we started up the AP 617 program, um, we had a series of, of listening um, sessions with the public, uh, with the community, and we wanted to really kind of understand what was the community's concerns, because that would then dictate what kind of monitoring efforts we would do within the community. Um, and, you know, what we've heard was that the community concern was really tied to uh, particulate matter from diesel emissions, uh, metals, including hexavalent chrome from industrial processes, uh, welding, um, you know, uh, brake pad wear from, you know, cars, trucks, and trains, as well as um, the toxic volatile organic compounds, again, from industrial processes, and as well as uh, vehicular emissions. 
So those are what we um, are gearing our current monitoring effort around is, is trying to get data that would help address these type of concerns by targeting these pollutants. And if we go on to the next slide, um, you know, why why are we concerned about those those type of of pollutants, right? Uh, it's it's really kind of traced back to what kind of health effects those pollutants uh, can cause. And so these um, this table here, this this pictogram here, kind of displays some of the um, health effects from air pollution and what some of those health effects are caused from. Like if we look at lung cancer, uh, we look at, you know, volatile organic compounds could cause lung cancer. Uh, being exposed to high levels of diesel PM over long period of time could also lead to lung uh, cancer as well as, as uh, toxic metals. Um, and so these are the things that we're going to be, be trying to tie the, the data back to. How does this particular um, pollutant, how could this affect you? Um, it do, not necessarily meaning it's causing that, um, but these are some of the things that long-term exposure to these type of pollutants could could cause uh, in, in the public. Uh, okay, so let's go to the next slide. Um, but one of the things that we need to be aware of, and this is something that air districts, um, not just local for San Diego, but you know the uh, at the state level and at the federal level, is that the concentration data doesn't necessarily tell the entire story. Um, and what traditionally air districts have been focused on is is more of just the concentration. And so these two maps here, is very similar. It's it's taking the concentration data. In this case, it's from ozone, um, and we're we're looking at it as what's the ozone values in San Diego County compared to the nation on a whole, and then just you know what is uh, what is the percent. So if you know if you have the highest ozone concentration in the nation you'll be ranked at the 100 percentile if you have the lowest in the nation you'll be at the zero percentile and so the graph the map on the left kind of shows based on concentration if you live near the coast um, ozone concentrations are low if you live inland the ozone concentrations are high but again concentration doesn't tell the entire story different people are affected differently at the same ozone concentration. Um, so if you have asthma and your friend standing right next to you is a marathon runner, um, the ozone that you're experiencing that day is going to affect those two people differently. Uh, and so if we look at, if we take the graph on the left and apply it to social economical factors, you get the graph on the right which looks very differently. Um, you start to see areas that were gray on the coast, which indicate a lower percentile start to turn yellow, turn orange, turn red. And so they're still experiencing the same concentration, but because of the population, the population in that area is more susceptible to ozone. And so it's, it's as if, they had are experiencing a higher concentration of ozone. And this is a viewpoint that um, all air districts need to more start focusing on is not just the concentration, because the concentration doesn't tell the whole story. You really need to look at it from also a social economical factor in with it. And so we really need to be looking more at the map on the right when we start looking at, you know, where do we place monitors? What kind of incentive programs do we need to do? What kind of um, permitting, um, cons you know, considerations do we need to to take into account? Like we need to be looking at the map on the right, not the map on the left. Um, and so if we move on to the next slide, we'll actually now look at some data that was collected in the community. Uh, this was a study that APCD commissioned uh, with a private uh, contractor called Aklama. Um, they drove through the community uh, and measured a series of pollutants listed here. Um, 
and so the question is 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 why why did we measure these particular pollutants listed here um and the reason is is that what we wanted to do and this kind of ties into the purpose um what we wanted to do is get a kind of a broad view of what is the pollutant concentration in the community. Again, historically, we just had a single monitoring station located at Perkins, um, which was fine for our regional perspective, but it doesn't tell us about if there's highs and lows within the community just as a region as a whole. So we wanted to look at a very kind of broad range of pollutants. Um, one thing you'll notice is that there's not volatile organic compounds on this list. Um, volatile organic compounds are um, emitted from a variety of sources, but one of the, the more dominant ones in San Diego County as a region is from cars. And so we looked at surrogates of CO, NO, NO2, which are good vehicle markers um, as, as kind of a surrogate. And so the purpose of this monitoring study was to look at, is there high concentration areas of pollutants that we didn't know about? And if there are, then what we wanna do is target our community-based monitoring near those locations. Um, again, why are these pollutants? Um, these pollutants also have the instrumentation that have very rapid response and that's what's needed if you're going to be driving you know i mean if you think about it if you're driving you know 20 30 40 miles an hour you're going to cover a very long distance very quickly and so you want very quick responding instrumentation um, so again what was the purpose of of this monitoring the purpose was to see if there was any very high spots within the community that um you know just from a, a air pollution control perspective, maybe we didn't see because of, of you know, unknown sources or um, topographical areas that would trap pollutants that we, we wouldn't see or think about. Um, so if we go on to the next slide, we can kind of see some of the results of that. Now, I know this is very hard to, to read. Um, and, you know, in the top right, we kind of have the, the northern part of the port side and then on the kind of more bottom left is is more of the, the national city Chula Vista area. Um, the color scheme, if it's dark purple, it's low concentration. As you go to higher concentration, you go to blue to green and then the, the light green. Um, so if it's light green, it's very high concentration. If it's a dark purple color, it, it's lower concentration. Um, and as you can see, um, along this is that the high concentration areas, in this case, we, we look, we're looking at black carbon, um, is really along the major traffic routes. Um, and this doesn't really surprise us um, as, you know, we're expecting to have black carbon come from diesel emissions, uh, and we're going to see a lot of diesel trucks driving on the freeways, and, and that's what we see. Um, so that, that's kind of what we were using this ACOMA data for was to kind of, is there hot spots within the communities? Where are those, those high areas? And then let's plan around our monitoring. So after we did this study, if we go on to the next slide, um, we had a series of meetings with the, the steering committee um, back in probably 2020, um, late 2019. And, and we started asking, you know, let's, what are the locations of interest in which we, you know, could have monitoring? Uh, and so the committee came up with about 50 different locations. I think they're listed um, on the, they're, they're shown on the map on the right. Um, we went out and, and viewed a lot of these locations. In fact, most of them, if not all of them, um, we kind of narrowed down this list. We presented it to the committee. Um, we made some recommendations on on some of these um, some of these sites, uh, and the committee came together with collaboration with the district and kind of approved the the final list, which we've shown in previous slides. That's uh, about eight to ten monitoring sites in the community. Um, so, if we go on to the next slide, 
Um, so this is our, our current one here. I should have made those dot points a little bit bigger. Um, the sites in green are the sites that are currently in operation. The sites in yellow are the ones that we're actively working on. Um, and, and as uh, Nicholas um, mentioned earlier, um, you know, you look down in National City, you got the, you don't have any green sampling sites down there yet. Uh, we're working really hard with, with the Navy to get approval um, and get the monitoring site up and running there, um, as well as with the National City uh, Train Depot uh, location down there near, near the bottom. Um, also listed on this slide is the different pollutants that we're um, actively monitoring or planning on monitoring. I think we have, we have uh, the black carbon instruments have been out in the at the active sites for a number of years now. Um, same with organic and elemental carbon. Uh, we're gonna be starting the volatile organic compounds contract um, that's approved. And so we just need to work out logistics with the contractor and and uh, start that. So we'll have, um, we'll be starting that one um, probably within the next month. Uh, metals, we started that earlier this, this calendar year, uh, started that in January. And hexavalent chromium, we should be starting that up in the next month as well um, at, at Sherman Elementary School. Okay, so let's uh, move on to the next slide. Um, so I guess one of the things that I, I would like to get feedback from today after this presentation is, is kind of this slide here. This is what us and the um, subcommittee kind of discussed uh, last month. Uh, about the future presentation content. Um, and so what we're planning on doing is when we talk about a pollutant, you know, uh, black carbon, for instance, uh, we wanna inform this community, you know, what are the sources of that pollutant? What are the health effects from that pollutants? Are there any air quality standards or um, is it just uh, a risk factor? You know, if so, what is that risk factor? How does that kind of relate to the concentration. Um, we'll have obviously a part of it will be the data analysis, data interpretation. Uh, some of that will be, you know, looking at comparison to the air quality standards, or if there's not, you know, what is the risk factor associated with that? What is the, the risk that we're seeing based on the concentration? Um, and then also kind of some actions that the, you know, that the committee can either take or just Re the residents in the area can can do to minimize the impact of that pollution uh, or that pollutant um, on you as you go about your daily daily activities. So, for instance, um, you know, ozone is typically low in the morning, high in the afternoon. Uh, so, if you're asthmatic and you're thinking about when's the best time to go for a run, you're going to want to go running in the morning, not in the afternoon. Um, so those are the things that we want to, to do to try to help minimize you as our SERP strategies work on, on reducing the overall concentrations in the region. There's also little things that we can do as um, on, a, on a just private basis, on a one-on-one -on -one basis that we can do to minimize our in, the, the impact on us um, because the, constant, the, the pollutant concentrations aren't a steady state throughout the day, throughout the year, they, they vary through time. And so we wanna educate people as, you know, um, when those concentrations are high, when they're lower, when would be a good time to, to go out and do certain activities, when's a, when's a time that's not good uh, to go out. Uh, so if we can move on to the next slide. I think we have a couple polling questions, okay. So our first polling question um, is, is, you know, what, when we do these quarterly updates, um, you know, should we one on option one, focus only on one pollutant? So we'll talk about like diesel PM uh, one quarter, a second quarter, we'll talk about volatile organic compounds, a, a, um, a third quarter, we'll talk about uh, metals and chrome six. Um, so maybe you're only getting an update on any one pollutant once a year. 
versus trying to, which would be option two, talking about all pollutants every quarter. Uh, and so that would be, the, I guess, our first polling question that we, we would like to get some feedback on is, is should we focus only on one pollutant and a presentation, or should we focus on uh, all programs every quarter? Um, I see we got all three questions up here, so I'll go on. So as you're thinking about question one I'll, uh, and, and respond to that, let me talk about uh, the second question, which is, what is how, how do you feel about the length of the presentations uh, currently we've always kind of stuck to about a, a 12 to 15 minute presentation um, is that um, a good enough time do you think it should be longer should it be shorter um, or or keep it the same and the last polling question that we have is are we giving you guys enough time for question and answering? You know, currently we're, we're keeping it to about eight to 10 minutes. So the whole presentation uh, is, is about 20 to 25 minutes long. Is that uh, an adequate amount of time for, for questions at eight to 10 minutes? Should it be longer? Should it be shorter? Should it, should it be the same? Um, and so those are the, the kind of three main questions that, that we would like to, to get some feedback um, today on um so i'll let uh i guess we'll let you guys have some time to to think about that um and if you you know want to think about it later um i think if we go on to the next slide i think that's that's really it um um which is just has our contact information you can feel free to to email us um any one of us um um you know to to provide additional feedback um, on on any of these, and so with that, I'd be happy to uh, answer any questions or elaborate on anything. Um, Joy, I see your hands up. Yeah, hi, uh, David. Thank you for that presentation, and I appreciate the poll too. Those look like good questions to be asking as we go forward. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just had the thought that in addition to the the quarterly reporting. I mean, if there is an incident in the community like the Navy ship fire, you know, that occurred three years mm -hmm. ago, I mean, mm -hmm. there might need to be supplemental information. So we of can course. get information on that sooner and, and relevant to that particular uh, that particular issue. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, I think that I was really just kind of focused on just, you know, our, our kind of routine monitoring, monitoring efforts uh, in the community and not any type of, you know, incident response. Um, obviously on an incident response, we'll be providing, you know, updates, uh, ideally daily uh, and, and ideally probably multiple times a day, um, you know, so that that will be a completely separate um, kind of monitoring and reporting effort. Um, but yeah. Okay, thank you. Do we have any other questions, comments, concerns? Yeah, and friendly reminder to hit submit at the bottom of your poll. That's captured. And we currently have about half folks um, have submitted their responses. Definitely. Yep. Yeah, hi, I had, um, I just had a question and that kind of pertains to the presentation of information and data. Mm -hmm. um, and how, you know, I, I, I really love this presentation and, and the ideas um, that you've brought forward, including um, kind of how the data we're collecting compares to air standards. Um, I was wondering if there is a way to also, because I know the the SERP is written a little bit differently. There's not kind of number 
cutoffs for air standards, but I was just wondering in terms of presenting air data, if there's a way to kind of show how how close we're getting to SERP goals or or um, kind of a, a way to tie it into the SERP as well. Okay, yeah, I mean, we can definitely uh, incorporate that in, into the SERP goals um, as, you know, as we're looking at gluten A, Y, or Z, um, how that kind of compares to to some of the SERP goals and, and how we're moving towards that. Enjoy. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to respond to, to uh, Dr. Yoon and and note that there is a SERP goal to develop a a goal for like what would be the the maximum you know health risk from locally generated pollutants that we'd want to see at any location in the community. So I mean we do have that as one thing to compare it to as we're looking at data like the toxics that doesn't actually have. Uh, federal air quality standards for it. Yeah, yeah. I think that the challenge on on that from the from the data that the monitoring team at APCD does is is that we're not measuring all the toxics, uh, and so we might it, it, we might need CARB to do more of a modeling effort that they would include all the toxics um, to do that because like we would we're measuring just a subset of that and so our if we add up all the concentration and multiply them by the risk factor and generate a risk number that's really kind of underselling that that number because it's it's really only tied to a subset of of all the toxic data that that um, emissions inventory have so I mean, I, I mean we can we can do it but I, we just want to make sure that i'm not giving you guys a false sense of security because the, the number is probably going to be a little bit higher. And I see Jose has their hand raised. Yes, um, I also was wondering if you can um, also compare our data, the, the, the this community's data with the region as a whole mm -hmm. uh, to see trends, maybe the region as a whole, if let's say if they're on a particular, um, um, like say PM two point five, they um, the last ten years, the, the, the they've been the region has reduced by ten percent of emissions, but the, but the community is reducing seven percent, mm -hmm. and it will be good to know if or we're trending behind, or if actually our strategies actually are moving us even further than the region as a whole. So if to compare the our community with it with the rest of the district. Okay. Yep. Yep. That that's something that if we have that data available, yeah, we can definitely tie into to how how this community compares to other communities in San Diego with for the same data. Thanks everybody. And just confirming that folks can see or Johnny has the poll ended yet. You should be able to see results now. Great. So feel free to walk through those, David. Okay. Um, okay. So the first one is it's dead even um, on on whether or not we should focus on one pollutant at a time or or one every or all of them every quarter. Um, that's that's interesting. Um, I think my my concern. I, I guess about doing all programs every quarter is especially looking at um, number two with it being about the same length of, of 10 to 12 minutes is is that we're, we're going to have a hard time trying to discuss every program in, in 12 minutes with if we back up on the slide I think the slide 12 I think where we, we, we discuss all the pollutants, where they're coming from, what's the data analysis, it's gonna be very difficult to do that. So if we wanna do all pollute, all programs, we should probably increase the length of the presentation. Um, and then that then now concerns me of whether or not we're overwhelming everybody with, with too much information. Uh, and so my, I guess my recommendation is, is to focus on one pollutant per quarter, but I also know now that that's only given us um, that one pollutant once every nine months or once every 12 months, depending upon how many different programs we have. 
Um, but it looks like for for two and three, we're looking at um, the the presentation length is is good of twenty twenty to five minutes total. So. Thanks, David, everybody, for your comments. Unless there's nothing else on this agenda item, I think we can move on to the next discussion item. Seeing none, thank you again, David. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Moving along, um, wanna hand it over to um, our colleagues at Sandag who will be giving a brief overview on um, a proposed letter of support that they'd like to introduce to you all today. Thank you, Chui. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Mariela Rodriguez. I am a senior regional planner with the strategic partnerships team at Sandag. And today I wanted to provide a quick update on the Harvard 2.0 uh, project. Next slide, please. So Caltrans and Sandag are currently working on the Harvard 2.0 system of, of requirements, which is a roadmap uh, for the development, deployment, and operations of the future Harbor Drive multimodal corridor. The project is based upon and developed by uh, stakeholders and partner, partner agencies input, including the Port of San Diego, as Renan mentioned earlier in her presentation. Sandag, Caltrans, the city of San Diego, the city of National City, and the San Diego Metropolitan Transit um, System, and the naval-based San Diego. Next slide, please. The project uh, aims to provide complete streets and enhancement and enable safe access, safe access to transit and active transportation networks by workers and residents. It also aims to decrease pollution and greenhouse gas emissions from trucks idling and improve community safety. It would also develop and connect a connected sustainable freight corridor to enable efficient movement of goods and people between the working waterfront and I-5 and SR-15. It would also improve the uh, working waterfront access and rehabilitate pavement in certain locations, which are shown on this map. Um, the project supports the port site SARP goal number one, one, nine, sorry, uh, which is the completion of Harbor 2.0 by 20, year 2031. Next slide, please. Improvements along this corridor include dedicated track lanes, which will keep freight moving safely and smoothly between the waterfront facilities and the freeway network while avoiding residential streets. Technology will be installed and such as freight signal prioritization and other intelligent transportation systems to reduce use and allow trucks to move through the corridor more efficiently and safely. This project proposes also to install zero emission commercial vehicle charging stations with electric conduit infra infrastructure, which will advance sustainable freight fleets by the Port of San Diego and help achieve emission reduction targets. Next slide. Next slide, please. This graph um, shows the key uh, steps in, of the environmental process. And over the last few months, uh, Caltrans has participated in several public outreach events to inform the public of the Harbor 2.0 project and receive comments from the community. The events include the community bike walk and beautify event at SR15, the Chicano Park Day and the Barrio Logan Community Planning Work group. The project team is preparing the draft environmental document and report uh, and project reports, which include the traffic study, geotechnical study, and environmental studies, including cultural, biological, noise, and hazardous waste, uh, which are ongoing. The project will be, will 
be circulated, the, the reports, sorry, will be circulated for comments internally and externally in the summer of 2023. And a public hearing will be held in the fall of 2023, around the month of September. After um, the draft reports have been released to the public, they will be uh, provided for them to have some input into the um, into the reports, and the project team will address those comments to prepare the final reports for environmental clearance. Next slide, please. So this is a high-level uh, project schedule focused on the milestones for the environmental clearance process. Um, as shown here, uh, the project approval and environmental document completion are anticipated to be completed by winter 2023, and the project is anticipated to be completed by winter 2028. Next slide, please. So finally, I wanted to share that uh, Harvard 2.0 is anticipated to be awarded $18.5 million from the California Transportation Commission from the Trade Corridor Enhancement Program uh, at the end of this week, um, once the commissioners meet and approve that award. And this brings us to the letter of support uh, item included in today's agendas. Uh, the Port of San Diego, Caltrans, and Sandag are partnering on the grant application for the reduction of track emissions at the board facilities uh, to fund the right-of-way phase of the project. Um, next slide. And here is the contact information for Jose Robles at Caltrans um, and my colleague Andrea Hoff and my contact information as well. Um, if you have any questions or comments on the project itself, you can contact either one of us. And with that, I'm going to pass it back to Chui. Thank you, Mariela. So um, my colleague Anna will add the letter into the chat, um, letter of support template. But um, essentially, Sandag is asking for the committee's support um, for this funding opportunity to um, um, receive additional funding for this project. Um, but because we didn't receive the support letter um, within a week of, before this meeting, um, we have flagged this as a sensitive agenda item that will be brought to you all um, over email for consideration um, and approval. Um, so for today's meeting, we are treating it um, as a discussion item to see if you all have any questions on the project or the letter of support template itself um, before we send it out to you all um, for um, consideration over email um, because Sandag um, has a deadline of, um, I believe it was July 17th. To yes, send this letter. July. July 17 for the letters, to receive the letters of support from any uh, group and agencies that support our application. And this is a combined application that the port is leading and Sandagan Caltrans are supporting, uh, just to clarify. Great, thanks, Mariela. With that, are there any questions for Mariela or the team on this project? Philip? Yeah, thanks, uh, Chewy, and thanks, Mariella, for the presentation. And I just want to um, let the steering committee know that this is a really important project that's been in the works for a long time. And, you know, Caltrans, Sandag, the port, and others have, have put a lot of effort into this. And we're thrilled that um, there's already announcements of some funding uh, for this project. And um, as the steering committee, choose on this uh, over email. Uh, I, I, I think this is a great project to support and get behind. Uh, there's a lot of money out there right now from state and federal resources. And this is a great example of, of bringing that investment here to San Diego. So I, um, I urge you to support it. Thank you. And I just wanted to add that uh, this is a good continuation of uh, having this award coming to us uh, for the first grant application that we submitted 
uh, with Caltra and Sandag, uh, and, Sandag, and um, it would be great to get the support from the community, like Phil said. Jose? Um, thank you. I also will, would like to encourage everyone to support this, uh, this project. Uh, I want to remind like uh, everyone that, uh, like Marilla said, this project is included in, a, in, in the emission reduction plan. It was selected by the, by the steering committee as a, as a, a, as a, a top priority project. It's, it's a multimodal project that supports, um, like Marilla was saying, um, bicycle transit, uh, freight also creates a, a, a truck route. So we don't have all these trucks getting into the community. So overall, it's a really good project and we, are, we urge everyone for your support. Thank you. Thank you, Jose. Do folks have any questions on the project or the, the letter itself? Joy? Yeah, I mean, of course, we'll need to, to read the letter, you know, before uh, responding on support. But I, I did want to note that that support for Harbor Drive 2.0 is one of the recommendations that came to the steering committee from the land use subcommittee. So this is one where, you know, that group of, of you know, folks that was a lot of the community residents were on that committee and supported this. So just want to uh, go back and remember that little bit of the history of how that came to be part of the SERP. Thanks for that, Joy. Great. And in terms of process, um, I um, definitely recommend folks to review the letter template that we sent over, and it's in the chat right now, um, and send any over any comments or feedback you might have on the language over to Mariela, um, and then she can prepare um, an official letter of support um, that we could take to you all for a vote. Great. Is there anything else folks want to add? Great, hearing none. Um, and we are, I do want to flag that we only have eight minutes left in our meeting and Sandag graciously agreed to move their um, sustainable freight strategy presentation to next month. Um, but thank you all for for getting that presentation um, ready. Um, and looking forward to having that um, at the next meeting. Um, now I wanted to open it up to um, our general public comments section and see if folks have any public comments that they wanna um, share to the full group on items that weren't listed on the agenda. And this is, a also a great space or time to share any future agenda items you'd like to see um, at a future meeting. Phil? Sorry. Um, I just wanted to let everybody know that, um, um, and I think I've reported out on this before at, at the meeting that, um, We've been out at our terminals doing what we call uh, terminal truck uh, outreach to people coming to the Port of San Diego. Um, the port has been there, uh, EHC has been there, so Melly and Nick and Zach and uh, folks from EHC, as well as uh, folks from APCD, as well as SDG&E come out. Tomorrow, we're going to be out in the field again the fourth time this year to educate truck drivers about zero emission regulations that exist in California. Uh, we educate them about funding that's available for zero emission trucks, technical assistance programs so they can start their planning. It's really kind of a grassroots effort where we just, you know, meet with truck drivers as they come through and stop and have lunch with us and, you know, we share information with them. So I want to thank, you know, our colleagues at EHC and others who have been um, doing this with us. I think it's been successful and we'll be out there again tomorrow doing it from 7 till 1 p.m. Thanks. Um, 
Thanks for sharing, Carl. Okay. Any other public comments folks want to share? Nick? Yeah, um, just just really quick. Um, I know last during the last CSC meeting, I think uh, Monique made an announcement about new leaf biofuel and there being a hearing about that. Um, so the hearing happened, I think, earlier this month. And, you know, there's been um, some actions taken by the hearing board to approve uh, some changes to an abatement order. So new leaf is going to be changing some things at their operation. I just want to elevate it. And and thank APCD staff for uh, continuing to to monitor the issue of odors in the neighborhood and monitoring this this facility. So, yeah, thank you. Awesome. Thanks for sharing, Nick. Okay, last call for any public comments or shout outs. Great, seeing none, moving on to our closeout. Um, and then, yeah, thanks everybody um, for your continued engagement on the committee um, and um, all the work that you've done so far and coming up with now the committee is approved. Um, I wanted to hand it over to Monique and Domingo for any closing remarks. Thank you, Chuy. Uh, just to thank everybody for their participation, their continued engagement, um, and all of their input, um, whether it was on the SERP or through implementation or now the, the subcommittees. I think all the the work that we're all doing in partnership is very important. So it's it's nice to see this again, this continued engagement. Um, really looking forward uh, to the work that will come out of the subcommittees and to continue those conversations uh, with all those groups. And um, thanks again. And just as a reminder, if there's anything that you would like us to uh, include on the agenda for future meetings, definitely let us know at any time. You can email me, you can email Monique, you can email Chewy, um, and we'd be happy to, um, to add that to the proposed agenda. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everybody. And with that, we'll close out the meeting a little early with three minutes to spare. Thanks, everybody. And we'll see folks on July 25th. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Buenas noches. Buenas noches. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Buenas noches.